All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, with a new entrant into the presidential race, we've got another opportunity to inspect the status quo bipartisan foreign policy consensus that has led us to endless wars, endless military expansion, and nearly limitless executive national security powers. Even among the conventional Democrats, Mike Bloomberg stands out for his right-wing neocon hawkishness. After all, he did used to be a Republican. Matty Hassan has a great piece out at The Intercept looking at his views. Not only did he support the Iraq invasion, but he championed the dumbest of the Iraq lies, like the idea that Saddam Hussein was somehow involved in 9-11. Not only does he adopt the standard rhetoric on Israel, but directly defended a disproportionate response in their attacks on Gaza. He's been palling around with MBS and lauded the Crown Prince's reforms even after the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Obviously, he said nothing about the war crimes that have made Yemen the site of the greatest human calamity on the planet. Bloomberg once described the city of New York under his leadership as a luxury product. I guess not being bombed is also a luxury product. Let's just pause for a moment to consider how damaging and radical this set of views truly is, how devastating this foreign policy has been to our nation and to the world. The Iraq war alone cost hundreds of thousands of lives, trillions of dollars, destabilized the Middle East, led to massive refugee flows that have destabilized Europe as well, and was almost certainly the most devastating strategic blunder of a generation. Yet for some reason, Cheerleading this absolute human catastrophe is barely challenged by the media, while one meeting that Tulsi had with Assad is apparently disqualifying and something she must answer for in literally every single media appearance and every debate. This makes absolutely zero moral sense. It only makes sense from the perspective of a media that has been complicit with the national security state in drumming up the case for war time and time again. Bloomberg may actually have the worst foreign policy views of the field, but it's cold comfort when you consider the power that the military-industrial complex will have over any incoming president. That's one of the parts of the Trump administration that's been so incredibly revealing. Just consider this whole Ukraine episode. Watching the testimony of these officials, you come to realize just how deeply committed they were to the principle of providing lethal weapons to Ukrainians, which, as Aaron Maté argued, is likely to make the region less stable, not more. They were so disturbed that Trump would delay their Javelin missile acquisition that they sparked an impeachment probe. It's made me realize that anyone who doesn't have a fully formed op oppositional view to the national security state and the stomach to fight for that view is just going to be absolutely ruled. Just look at Obama. His 2008 victory was as much about Iraq war opposition as anything else. It was certainly the linchpin of his victory over Hillary and a crucial argument in his case against the hawkish McCain, who famously commented it was fine with him if troops stayed in Iraq for 100 years. But the young president was ultimately either seduced or bullied by the national security state. Drone strikes, warrantless surveillance, Syria, Libya, and oh, by the way, we are still mired in Afghanistan to this day. His operating principle of don't do stupid shit was not nearly strong enough pushback against an ever-expanding imperialist security state. And so in the end, the man who won a Nobel Peace Prize for his campaign promises left office having gotten us into more military engagements that he got us out of. So what do we make of the current field? Well, there's really only one question that you need to ask yourself. Who is willing to go to the mat? against a national security state that is willing to leverage every tool of propaganda to convince the media and the public that your decisions are terrible and dangerous and will lead to the next 9-11. Biden's views are obviously the most formed and the most consistent with the radical status quo. He not only voted for the Iraq war, but as chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee helped the Bush administration to make the case. Most of the other candidates really don't have much to say on the issue. They're all trying to stake out some Goldilocks regime change for all who want it position. Warren, in particular, has been quite squishy on how she views foreign policy. For example, she issued a mealy mouth statement on Bolivia in which she failed to call the military coup a coup, referring instead to interim leadership, even as that interim leadership was murdering protesters in the street. The Intercept's Ryan Grimm recently tried to pin her down on this issue. Let's take a listen. The interim government has recently said that armed forces who shoot and kill protesters will have immunity. Uh, during the during the protest, do do you believe that when the military pressured Evo Morales out of power that that was a coup? And and what is the U.S. role right now going forward? Boy, it sure looks like that. You know, whenever the military intervenes uh, in a civilian transfer of power, that's not good, and it is dangerous for democracy. She inches closer to the c-word, but studiously avoids actually saying the word coup. This kind of equivocating from Warren or Pete or whoever 
will lead to one outcome, getting completely rolled by the military industrial complex and a continuation of the foreign policy status quo. So again, I ask you, who will be willing to pay the price? Well, last week's debate made it clear who at least has a shot at standing up to the bipartisan war consensus and its media and national security apparatus promoters. Obviously, Tulsi has made bucking the foreign policy status quo the signature of her campaign. But in my eyes, the most telling moment of the night came when Bernie, of his own volition, stood up for the dignity and human rights of Palestinians. Let's take a listen. What Senator Harris is doing is unfortunately continuing to traffic in lies and smears and innuendos because she cannot challenge the substance of the argument that I'm making, the leadership and the change that I'm seeking to bring in our foreign policy, which only makes me guess that she will, as president, continue the status quo, continue the Bush-Clinton-Trump foreign policy of regime change wars, which is... is deeply destructive. It is no longer good enough for us simply to be pro-Israel. I am pro-Israel. But we must treat the Palestinian people as well with the respect and dignity that they deserve. <laughs> what is going on in Gaza right now, where youth unemployment is 70 or 80 percent, is unsustainable. Amazingly, Bernie's comments there about the dignity of Palestinians were greeted with raucous applause by the audience. The power of our commander-in-chief is awesome and vast with the power to shape the future of our nation and the globe. There are no guarantees that any president, when push comes to shove, will be strong enough to ultimately buck the war machine. But it's at least worth knowing who will actually try. Um, Sagar, this doesn't get enough focus in the campaign. No, it does. And, you know, I watched this happen with Trump. How yeah. many times did Trump say, I want to get out of Afghanistan? And then the military was like, okay, well, uh, you can do that in two years. And he's like, okay, I'll give you two years. Go and kill the Taliban. I'll give you all the troops that you need. I'll give you all the firepower, rules of engagement. All the military blamed for years Obama on rules of engagement, blah, blah. Of course, Okay, yeah. so he gave it to him. He said everything they wanted, he gave it to him. Oh, and then the Taliban gained more ground. And so he's like, well, what's the issue here? He's like, well, the Afghans are still corrupt. The, uh, the military's not working. We need more troops, and we need to stay longer. He's like, no, 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 no. That's not what That's we not agreed the deal. upon. Yeah. Same thing on Syria. They were, he was like, I want to get out of Syria. They said, you got to kill ISIS first. He says, okay. So we destroy ISIS. Then he's like, okay, I want to get out of Syria. They're like, no, now we have to protect the Kurds. And he's like, no, no, I, I, didn't, I don't want that. So they said, give us six months. He says, okay, I'll give you six months. So he gave him six months. They're like, now we need another year. That's how it works. And now they're You in need Syria. somebody who is willing to stay up and say, no. We're getting out now. Give me a plan. They will steamroll you at every single turn. If they you did are it to not Obama. Completely yeah. committed. You, yeah. Oh man. I mean, they will leak against you. They did this to Obama. They oh, did yeah. this to Trump. And both. I mean, Trump says I want to get out of Afghanistan. His national security advisor hands him a plan to send seventy thousand more troops to Afghanistan. And then so he only sends five thousand. So it's a compromise. But they still win. Well, and all these people yeah. who right now are at MSNBC and yeah. CNN, national security state operatives, who are right now right. going against President Trump. They're still going to have their contracts. Oh, yeah. If a Democrat takes over, right. if you've got Bernie Sanders in the White House, they will be just as happy to go out and use propaganda to convince people that his decisions are going to mm -hmm. are going to be dangerous for America and they're compromising our security, just like you said, just like they did to Obama. And they you can see that time. all happening. And look, Trump is so like distracted and ADD. He says one thing when they just think that they can roll him yeah. and like keep him distracted they long have, enough to do March. what they want, and yeah. they have. That's been a successful strategy. Right. You have to have someone who not only has the ideology and the values, but the stick to itness and is willing to take that hit in the media from the national security state to actually do yeah. what is they right. They will leak against you every single day of year. This is what happened to Trump. This is what happened to Obama and, and even to Bush in certain respects. They, they, they leak against you every single day of your presidency. They'll use their allies on cable news and all these other people to create an echo chamber, which only the strongest men can actually survive. Right. You need to have absolute priorities. And this is the thing, is you got to know where somebody stands on these things and who's willing to stand up for what, because when the push comes to shove, most of the time, people fold. So you got to know exactly what they care about, what they're willing to sacrifice, what they're not willing to. And that's the most important thing to consider whenever you vote for president. Absolutely. All right, Sagar, looking forward to your radar next.